Okay, so Ruth is back at the lock. I'm uh, not Ruth. I'm sorry. Isabel is back at the rot locked and is not very happy about it either. She's kind of in her own little mind right now. She's angry. She has the melancholy. She's sad. Um, Curzon tried to talk to her and she told him she didn't ever want to see him or talk to him again. So she's in a real bad place right now. Okay. Remember, it was hot there and um, they hadn't had any rain. But the storm that hit the city the next night was the worst I had ever seen. A thundercloud, big as a mountain, swept up the river just before sunset. Lightning danced at its edges like horses at a mad gall gallop. Then the sky turned ink black and the storm crashed over us. The wind blew signs off buildings, overturned soldiers' tents, and stripped the clean cloth clothes that they had pegged out to dry. Thunder boomed like a thousand cannons. A house three blocks over was struck by a lightning bolt and burned to the ground. Thirteen soldiers were killed by lightning, too. The coins in their pockets melted and their flesh roasted. One lightning-struck soldier survived, but was turned deaf, blind, and unable to speak from the lightning. We were forced to concern ourselves with more domestic matters. The, the window frames in the front parlor leaked terribly during the storm. Rain soaked the drapes and rugs and left the wall plaster soft and spongy. Tell the girl to clean up this mess. I'm making a pretty good Mrs. Uh, Madam Lockton, aren't I? You like that voice? Hmm. Becky asked around for days, but there, was no, there were no spare carpenters to be found, no matter how much coin was offered. The men were all getting ready for war. The British had set up a new camp in Brooklyn on Long Island, and Washington was moving his troops around like pieces on a checkerboard. He sent most of his men across to face the British and others north to defend Fort Washington and Harlem. The front windows continued to leak. Becky began to talk of leaving for her uncle's house in Jersey. I pretended to listen to her. The street, I pretended to listen to her, yeah. The streets were filled with the hurry scurry of a moving army splashing through mud puddles. Madam called for tea. I left to fetch fresh water. A few bees flew over my head as I walked north with my buckets blown out by the strong east wind. The pain helped too. I had cut the palm of my left hand on a dull blade at breakfast. Becky wrapped it for me, but it stung to carry even an empty bucket. Nassau Street was the was fair deserted all the way up to the commons. Most folks had fled, afeard to be caught between two angry armies. That's why I was surprised to see a crowd at the water pump. A dozen or so men and boys, slaves who had been hired by the army to build barricades, and a few women fetching water like me. Beyond the men, I could see the pile of paving stones that had been pulled up for the barricade. It was midday, and the folks were gathered for a cool drink, a bite to eat, and some conversating. The talk stopped as I approached. All eyes went to my face. I had not been to the pump since my branding. I gripped the buckets tight, holding in the pain. Most in the crowd were strangers to me. Mercy, muttered one woman as she studied my scar. Pain you much? asked another woman, her hair wrapped in a worn yellow cloth. It tugs some, ma'am, ma I said. Not as much as it did. One man spat over his shoulder and said something in a language I did not understand. The other men turned their eyes from me back to Grandfather, the old man who sat by the plump pump, and went back to their argument. I was grateful to have the attention leave me. You're not looking at the facts, a bald man said to Grandfather. The British Lord Dunmore in Virginia offered freedom, total freedom, to any slave who escapes to his camp. He shook his fists in the air when he said, Freedom! Thousands have run away and joined up already. Grandfather simply nodded his head. With more behind them, I expect. A second man, this one with neatly trimmed hair, leaned on his shovel. Dunmore freed the Virginia slaves so the crops would go unharvested and ruin the planters. The British care not for us. They care only for victory. Some patriots own slaves, yes, but you must listen to their words, to their words, all men created equal. The words come first. They'll pull the deeds and the justice will be behind them. You're a fool, the bald man said. 
He motioned to the piles of paving stones and the logs waiting to be dragged into position. We should sabotage the barricades. If the British win, we'll all be free. Shh, several people scolded. I blinked. The beads in my head fell silent and hugged their wings tight to their bodies. The British would free us? All of us? The men fell to arguing with each other. The women chimed in occasionally. Finally, the bald man raised his hands. One of us here was privy to the rebel plans, worked with one of the bosses there. Tell us, Curzon boy, what do you think of the rebel liars? What do you think of the rebel lies? The sound of his name. Curzon stepped forward from the side of the building where he had been sitting in the shade. He looked even more changed than he had the week before. Hmm, what was different? What say you? Grandfather asked. I say I'm an American, Curzon said. An American soldier. Hmm, it was his clothes. When I first met him, he was dressed like the house servant of a wealthy man, which he was. Now the tailored waistcoat was gone, and his shirt was dirty with sweat and mud. It hung over a pair of working man's breeches that were cut off below with his knee. He did not have on stockings or shoes. Even his fancy red hat was flecked with mud. The wind caught at my skirts and swirled them around my ankles. Did he say soldier? The first man laughed. You are an American slave. He untied the cloth around his neck and rinsed it in the pump water before adding in a lower voice, as are we all. Curzon shook his head. He was still stubborn as ever, if a bit worn. Not me, not for long. Master Bellingham promised me freedom for enlisting in his place. <laughs> and you believe him? The man laughed louder. He's feeding you to the cannon so he can be safe. If you don't die, he'll stick your neck under his boot again. Lower your voices. Grandfather held up a shaky hand and motioned to me. Come, child, get your water. I walked to him and set my buckets on the ground. The woman in the yellow headcloth worked the pump for Grandfather. The British promised freedom to slaves, but won't give it to the white rebels, she said as she pushed the handle up and down. The rebels want to take freedom, but they won't share it with us. She set down the first bucket and picked up the second bucket. Both sides say one thing and do the other. The British act on their promises, insisted the bald man. No! The man with the shovel drove it into the ground with frustration. They lie. When the British fled Boston back in the spring, they took escaping slaves with them. They promised them freedom. And he stretched out the word until it sounded ugly. Where are those slaves now? No one answered. I'll tell you, he continued, forced into the Lewisburg coal mines in Canada. They work and die under the ground. They never see the sun, and they'll never taste your freedom. He stood in silence as a pump handle creaked. At last, Grandfather chuckled. <laughs> this is not funny, old man, said the fellow with the shovel. Young people are always funny, he said. Funny and foolish. The woman in the yellow headcloth finished filling the second bucket. What do you mean, Grandfather? she asked. This is not our fight, the old man said. British or American, that is not the choice. You must choose your own side. Find your road through the valley of darkness that will lead you to the River Jordan. We don't have the River Jordan here, Grandfather, the bald man said as he retied the wet cloth around his neck. We have the East River, with currents fast enough to kill a man, and the North River, two miles wide. Both are mighty hard to cross. Grandfather chuckled again. You don't understand. Everything that stands between you and freedom is the River Jordan. Come closer, child. This last he said to me. I stepped in front of him and reached for my buckets, but he took my hands in his. I stopped unsure what to do next. Look at me, he said. I bent down a little, bringing my face level with his. He tilted my chin to the side so he could examine the brand on my cheek. I tried to pull away, but he held. A scar is a sign of strength, he said quietly, the sign of a survivor. He leaned forward and lightly kissed my cheek right on the branding mark. 
His lips felt like a tired butterfly that landed once and then fluttered away. I stepped back and touched the cheek. The men were returning to the barricades. Other servants had formed a line for the pump. Grandfather winked and handed me the buckets. Look hard for your River Jordan, my child. You will find it. Carrying those full buckets back to the Lochtons was powerful hard. The cut on my left hand pained me too much to use it, and my right hand was not big enough, my arms not strong enough to carry two buckets at once. I journeyed in a crow-hop fashion, carrying one bucket for twenty strides, setting it down, and then returning to fetch the second bucket and carrying it forward to meet its partner. I made slow progress in this manner for two blocks when Curzon joined me. He would not look at me, didn't say a word, neither. He simply carried the buckets to the Lockton's gate for me and then walked away. So, she's going to find her River Jordan, according to Grandfather, um, and that's what's going to set her free. But now something's up with Curzon. He's no longer um, a servant to Bellingham because he doesn't have on those fancy clothes. He's kind of dressed like a slave um, with, with muddy clothes, no shoes, no socks, nothing. Um, so something's going on with him, and we're going to find out. So stay tuned.